My name is Pete Muller. Uh, I guess in a somewhat unconventional sense as a photographer, I'm going to start off by playing a little bit of audio <laughs> that we're uh, using as part of podcasts that we're creating. The newest comprehensive report on climate change and its effects was released yesterday. The news is grim. The a giant new, new government report says climate, climate change is already hurting the communities in the U.S. This is the largest fire in California state history. Glaciers now melt at an historic pace. A global emergency. If we do not take action quickly, the results of climate change threat to human civilization on this planet as we know it. The place that you live in raises you in a sense and it becomes a part of you and then to see that gone, you feel like you're losing the past and the future at the same time. So that, that voice that you hear emerging from that soundscape of disorienting warning is the voice of Callie Mooley Alexander. Callie uh, was one of my students at Mount Holyoke College in Western Massachusetts this last semester. She's 20 years old. She's from a place called Doddridge County, West Virginia, which is a place that's experienced considerable environmental transformation in recent years owing to natural gas exploration. When I uh, told Callie the project that I'm working on, she stopped by my office hours wanting to share with me some of her observations about the emotional experience of watching her home change. I was quite taken aback by the poignancy of her remarks about this unique idea of losing the past and the future at the same time. And I thought that Callie's remarks really shed a lot of insight into sort of the emotional dimensions of our changing planet. For the last 18 months, I have been a photographic fellow here, uh, and I've been investigating a type of feedback loop about how the world that we are changing is in turn changing us particularly in, in an emotional sense and our connections with the environments that we know. When I proposed this story at National Geographic, I knew that the society and the magazine had been the standard bearer for disseminating information about our changing planet, particularly in its physical manifestations, about the loss of sea ice and critical species, encroachment on wild places. But my photography has always been about the contours of human challenges and experiences. And I really wanted to bring some of that spirit and approach to the pressing conversation about our relationship with the environment. So I've been traveling a lot to a number of the front lines of environmental desolation in various parts of the world with a particular eye towards the emotional and psychological experiences that people are having as they watch these changes occur in front of them. Among other places, I've been working along the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, which is a place that, of course, many of you know, uh, owing to rising sea levels and coastal erosion, has had a considerable amount of land loss in recent decades. In particular, I'm working on an island called Aldejan Charles. Some of you may have heard of this place. It's been held up as a sort of infamous case of land loss. The island for a long time was a, quite an idyllic place, and in some ways it still is. Of course, the residents had access to all the bounty of the sea, but they also had productive farming lands, they had hunting grounds, they had beautiful trees, uh, many of which have since died as a result of saltwater intrusion on the island. While I've been there, I've spent a lot of time with a man named Chris Brunet, who's lived on the island his whole life. And what I'd like to do is allow Chris to tell us a story uh, as we look at some of the photographs that I have made on Aldejan Charles. Things began to change whenever the land began to change. My mom, she would talk about a persimmon tree how the island had persimmon trees, and the persimmons, she loved them. Well, lo and behold, on the side of the bayou, going down, going down the little bayou, to the right across the bayou, they had a persimmon tree that had grew. And so about 1998, 2000, 2001, she went picked 
the last litter of persimmons up in there that was growing on the side of the bank near a salt water bayou. And I ate some. Talk about sweet. It was just so delicious. So that right there showed to me that there was something she did as a child that that was the last time she was going to eat persimmons from off this island. So I, th I think that Chris Brunet is one of the greatest storytellers that I've ever met, and I've met a lot. I find this particular story about the persimmon trees and his mother to be incredible. I think it's powerful, and it's poetic, and it's painful all at once. And to me, it's such a clear distillation of this quiet yet resounding sense of loss that's occurring in the lives of more and more people around the planet. Now, we hear, I hear, you all, we all hear this cacophony of warning about the, what the future of environmental change is gonna mean for us. But what I'm learning is that for more and more people around the world, the effects are already here. They've arrived gradually and quietly but to quite astounding effect in the practical and emotional lives of people in these places. But the fact of the matter is, the story of Alde Jean Charles, the story that Chris tells us, these stories amount to one of the most pressing issues of our time, but these are not stories that scream. You know, these are stories that whisper. And I think if we have a hope of being able to call them out from that cacophony of disorienting, overwhelming, sometimes warning, it is so imperative that we know where and how to look and listen. For most of my photographic life, I photograph stories that scream. I photographed war and conflict, like this war in Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. I photographed the horrors of the Ebola virus in West Africa. I photographed the astounding, awe-inspiring political and social tumult that unfolded in the streets of Cairo after the overthrow of Hosni Mubarak. These are stories that represent the zenith of human drama, and they lend themselves so readily to these profound, haunting, galvanizing, action-encouraging photojournalistic pictures. That's why we've entrusted the technique of photojournalism to chronicle these stories for so long. But climate change is different. It's been done this profound disservice by being both gradual and elusive. And I knew that if I wanted to explore this subject, that I was going to have to push beyond the comfort zone that I'd had for so long, that I was going to want sound and concepts and memory and time, all of those elements I'd hope would come together to augment photography in the service of understanding this sense of emotional and psychological loss that's becoming so much more prevalent for so many more people. I really hope that we can use this story, the many stories that I've been working on on my fellowship, and the stories that so many of you are telling in this room, and harness this incredible, influential, trusted platform that we have at National Geographic to, hope, to hopefully encourage the mental metabolic transformation that we need to undergo in order to successfully confront these issues. Thank you very much.